So you want to be a real estate investor, but where do you start? How do you know what information and sources to trust? That's where I come in. I'm Johnny Catani, and this is the Investor Relations Real Estate Podcast. Hey guys, real quick, before we start, go to investwithkatani.com and download my free ebook, Is Commercial Real Estate Recession Proof? Now to today's show. What's up, guys, and welcome to another episode of the Investor Relations Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Johnny Catani. I am joined today by Jason Yarusi. Jason is an active real estate syndicator and investor. Jason and his wife, Peely, founded Yarusi Holdings, a multifamily investment firm that has acquired over 1,400 units valued at $160 million since 2016. He's an avid ultra runner and workout enthusiast, hosts the multifamily live podcast, wakes up daily at 4.32 a.m., and is an aspiring ukulele player. Most importantly, is a husband and father to three amazing kids. Jason, thanks so much for coming on. Hey, thanks for having me. Great to be here. Absolutely. I think we'd be remiss if we skipped over the ultra running and 4.32 a.m. wake up. Why so specific? You know, there, there are certain points where you want to save your decisions for things that really need to have your mind on it, right? And so you get to a certain pattern here where we, we spend a lot of time where we're saying we don't have time. But if you look at your, your daily decisions, what is points of your day that you're wasting a ton of time on, right? So is it, oh, you know, should I get up a little bit earlier tomorrow? Should I get to the point? Or is it, what should I do in the morning? Or what should I eat? Or what should I wear, right? There's so many points in your day that you can just eliminate your decisions and make them easier. So you can put the energy where you need to be, especially if you're short on time, right? And so- for me, uh, you know, I met my wife back in um, 2003. It took us about 10 years to really get together. But over that course, we were um, working in nightlife, right? So I, I ran uh, bars in New York City, opened up, you know, bars and restaurants there, um, opened and sold a brewery. So I was on a different capacity of just, you know, working late, working late in the night. Um, when we basically moved out to New Jersey to help uh, my dad's family, but the family construction business, you know, your life changes, right? You have to basically repurpose your entire day. And so I was in that grind where you're waking up, you're going, 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 and you're finding your days running around. And then we're on a point where my wife's pregnant with our first kiddo. And it was like, well, if I'm going to make a change, it's going to have to start with me because I, the kids, they, they don't care about my day. They don't care about how busy I, it's, it, they just want to spend time with that. Right. So getting my mind right by getting up in the morning, 4.32 AM, 4.321, go get up. Right giving me the time to have my headspace and be collected on my day. So as I get into the day, I've now taken time to compose myself, get my thoughts together, get my energy right. And then from there, I can lead into the day ahead. God, that's so powerful. And it's so true, right? Because so often, so many people just roll out of bed and jump right into it. And you're not in the right headspace and you're not, your energy is not where it needs to be. And it carries throughout the day. Whereas if you start correctly, focus. So, I mean, obviously this is the main focus, but what, what is kind of your morning routine? What does that look like? Obviously sounds like you're getting up early enough where it's just you. So you've just kind of taken your time. What, what does that look like? Yeah. So it's, it's constantly evolved, but typically I get up, I drink a glass of water, have a cup of coffee. I meditate. Um, I stretch for 10 minutes and then I work out. Right. And so I work out, I go out there, uh, do kettlebell and then run. Right. And then on that fact, when I get back, uh, my wife's typically up so I can give her time to have her moment. And if the kids are up, which usually one of the three or somewhere in the range of being active up there, I can take time to be with them, right? So we can each have our moment to get composed for the day. Um, and if you tie this back into the running, I put the running in there as well, because it's one of those things where I don't really say I'm a runner, right? I'm not, I don't, you know, I've never run long distance in school or anything, but I just started running as capacity of what, I wanted to do to put consistency in my day. And now it's become something I do because it's part of the process. And it's a thing I do, whether I don't feel like it or I do, whether it's rainy or it's sunny or, you know, cold or I'm sick or whatever, I just do it. And that's been that point, like knock it off, get a win out in the day and then get into the other points here where I can really have to focus on creating more wins throughout. And that hammers back to discipline. Discipline is really the root of, success honestly from what i found from talking to successful people and then obviously you're in the same capacity right like you said running no matter what even when you don't want to do it 
even when you're tired, doing it because you know that it just sets that tone and, and continues that because all it takes is missing one day yeah. and you miss the second day. And the next thing you know, you haven't run for three weeks and you're starting over. So awesome. It's easy not it. to do. Incredible. It's also easy to do. You know what I mean? It's, right. it's very easy not to do. But in the same front, once you get in a part, if you can find a way that you, that you set yourself in a path forward, because if you think about anything like, you know, the power of zero, right? If you do one times two times three times four times five times zero, it's zero, you know? And so no matter where you put that point, if you're constantly just killing yourself and creating setbacks for yourself, well, it won't be surprising or shouldn't be surprising that you haven't accomplished what you want because there's enough things pushing against us to, to try and keep us out of that point. But there's also a lot of reasons why the, the world wants us to win. You know, the universe will want you to succeed. So why not try and push ourselves back? Why not, why not excel ourselves forward with everything else we can do? Absolutely. I love that. Have you done any ultras out here in Utah? I live in Salt Lake City. No, I have not. Uh, so I will, right? I'm more of a spur, you know, in a, in six weeks, I just signed up for like a 50 or a hundred mile. Um, but that, that's more of in my route. Uh, there's been like, what is it? The, uh, is it Tahoe, like Tahoe 200? There's a couple of really cool ones out there for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. There's some fun ones. I got into long distance. I never did an ultra, but I got into like trail running, like, you know, 15, oh, yeah. 20 mile trail runs. So that was, uh, it's awesome. that was a lot of fun. Um, awesome. Well, all right. So let's get into the, the nuts and bolts here. I, I love uh, mindset. That's such a, such a huge thing. I love starting my day with, with all that, but um, let's kind of jump into it. Give us kind of the reader's digest version, how you got into real estate investing. Yeah. So mention a little bit, you know, we were in New York, um, Hurricane Sandy happens, horrific storm decimated a lot of the East coast. Um, my dad has a business where he lives and moves buildings, heavy construction, you know, lifts and moves houses. He's done this for over four decades. Lo and behold, he's doing 12 to 13 jobs a year. It's just one of these things where like how many times are you lifting up houses, right? It's just part of what he's done. Well, the storm comes around and his business overnight goes from, you know, a couple of calls here and there to hundreds of calls every day about lifting his house. So my brother's working for me in the city. Peely, who is at that time, my girlfriend and myself, we move out to help dad, really help dad just take it on. Well, one of the conversations that was happening even at that moment while we're in New York City between PLA and I is that we, we just had to find what was next to find back our time to just start taking control of our life. And when we moved out to New Jersey, the same thing is that, you know, when you're working in an active business where, where it's something of a service business, if you're not doing, there, there is no income, there's no point, right? You have to be doing to create. And it was that combination where if there was 25 hours in a day, eight days a week, we could have used every moment because the moment was that busy, right? Because we, we had no control over the time. The time was running us. So there was that idea about what could be next or that question and real estate came on board. Um, Peely's pregnant at the time. She ends up getting a real estate license and we decided to start flipping homes, wholesaling homes. And all of a sudden we find ourselves going further away from the goal, right? We're like, wow. So we were so busy with construction. Now we have all this other active stuff. Now we're we're twice as busy, right? And so that's going well. However, well in its own right is that, you know, if you look at money, money well versus, you know, life well, we were going further from the goal. It took her uh, Pili to meet someone at Aria, um, and that person was doing out of state rentals. And that was that first glimpse of like, oh, we can use how we've basically grown businesses, helped business expand, helped our own part, put together teams to accomplish goals with this thing called long, uh, you know, basically long state, out of state of investing. So we start doing that and getting some two units, some three unit properties and checks start showing up. We're like, wow, this is great. Except it wasn't going to be enough or at least the economies of scale wasn't going to be there for us to do what we wanted to do to really have the impact we were looking to have. Well, you know, I, I heard on a podcast, you know, just like someone listening here about large apartment investing. And that was that light bulb where I was like, well, that's all the pieces together. So we sold those properties, went all in with large apartment investing, dialed ourselves in. And that was, you know, fast forward 2016 into 2017, we were able to buy our first apartment building in 2017, which was a 94 unit in Louisville, Kentucky. Wow. That's awesome. What a great story and pretty common story, right? Of course realize you can't scale that single family wholesaling fix and flip somehow some people do but ultimately this is what it leads to so 
Love that. What um, you obviously started buying single family homes in the Midwest. Is that where you guys still continue to invest? Is that still an attractive market for you guys? We're, if we core source Louisville MSA, Nashville MSA, and Atlanta MSA. So now we're down, we moved from New Jersey down to Tennessee about 15, 16 months ago. So we're down here right in the middle of that. So we're basically in that through line. We have some ancillary properties, um, you know, East PA, um, one over in Little Rock. So we have a couple of different assets and a couple of different markets. Mainly everything has been honed in between those three MSAs. Awesome. Love it. Great markets. Under, I mean, obviously a lot of competition probably, as you guys have seen, starting to move into those areas. Oh, yeah. Um, where in Tennessee are you? Uh, we're in Murfreesboro, about 20 minutes south of Nashville. So, yeah, nice. we've been really honed in on these counties here, Wilson, uh, Williamson, Rutherford, Davidson, which kind of surround the, the east or all the way down to the, the south around Nashville. Another area that's just blowing up, going crazy. So I know, obviously, the big thing that um, you guys talk about on your website is, is really your big focus is repositioning effective asset management. What is that? you know, acquisition process and and really that whole process look like for you guys that you you has made you successful. Yeah. So we're, we're operators, right? So when we come into these projects here, we want to have a plan for it. We want to have the team in place. We also want to empower the team to put forth the best light so they can accomplish the goals as well. Right. So we've looked at these as community part is that we want to improve the community for the residents, right? So if you find a way to improve the community, for the residents, they're going to be happier to live there. And when they're happier to live there, they're going to treat it more like their home, not like a place that you're just passing by. So from that fact, that will help eventually on your operating expenses, right? They're going to take better care of it. They're going to call you when there's an issue, right? They're going to not just let it happen. They're not going to let the sink or the toilet run for a week or two weeks to get back to it. They're going to call you so you can continue to make the improvements. On the other side of it, you have to show up to make those improvements. So part of the process out of the gate is to, of course, improve the landscaping, improve the signage, improve the, ex- improve the exterior. Also, we'll call it tenant training, but let tenants know that you're there to fix things, right? Many times you're taking on the building that they're used to the same old thing where they have to call seven, eight times and they don't get a response so they just stop calling, right? So make this place a better community to live, a safer community to live, whether that's improving the amenities, and, you know, um, doing the hallways, things of that capacity. And that will trend in because new tenants coming in there of course, if you're inside out, unit focused first, you know, their first impression was going to sell the property. So if you can improve the exterior first, make people see it's going to be better, and then take the units that are, of course, offline and put them back on a market. Well, when, when you do come up for renewals, the ter- current tenant base is going to say, well, okay, I see the works being put in here. You're going to have a better product offered at a good rate here. I'd rather go through a lease up or a renewal here than move out. Right. So focusing, of course, and not just so driven by the income of the rent, because, in fact, you know, the, the worst fear of any tenant is new ownership comes in, they're going to raise our prices. Right. So how can we make this so it's a win win for both sides? And you really nailed it on the head there when you focus on the, the residents instead of, you know, the profits. What you find and what I've noticed, because we've done the same thing in Oklahoma City with a few few deals that I worked on last year, is the tenants that are there, while they are typically maybe not the dem- not all of them are the demographic you want, especially when you're getting into some of the C-class, but when you actually focus on those amenities and treating them and getting to their repairs, they're actually okay with the increase in, in the rent and they will stay. Correct. Yeah. When you, you just think about it from the other way, we're always driven by income and the income comes like there's a lot of ways to make this better and capture on what needs to be to meet the market. Right. So is there pet fees, their application fees, there's other income drivers. Will there be that point? But if you lead first with your rent just going up, right. How would anybody feel? Right. And so showing value to get value back. That's always the full cycle of what makes a great relationship. And that same thing with you and your apartment community. Absolutely. So kind of, Let's go back to the beginning. What what does it look like in terms of, are you guys, do you guys do the heavy lifts? Are you okay with that? Are you like very location focused? So, you know, if it requires a lot of CapEx, but it's in a location you want, you're willing to do that or kind of talk us through that process for you guys. 
we don't mind the CapEx hit. I, I'm just trying to be a point here where we have some sustained occupancy, even if it's poor, even if it's poor occupancy, right? So even if the, if we'll say economic occupancy is low, I'm willing to take on that tenant base to see if it's a management problem at first. So the one we just uh, brought probably a year and a half, two years ago, you know, 93 unit here in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, it had weekly rentals, right? So we had 50% of the units were weekly rentals. I've never seen this before. Well, we came in there, we did the point of actually turning about 50% of the building in year one, and we turned almost 86, 87% of the building in year one, right? So cleaned it all up, made it a great place to live. You know, you got to the point, uh, it almost looked like a jail when you first brought it. Now it's a great spot. We redid we, we all the amenities here. You got kids playing outside. Our effective rent at the time when you back out that the uh, owner was paying um, cable, he was paying electric, the rents were low. The effective rent at that time was like uh, 553 and now we're up over a thousand, right? And so when you think about the, the draw and the, the approach here, plus they were really management heavy. It's like running an Airbnb when you have this, it's like running a, like a motel. They were like furnishing units, they had people in on weeks and we still have two or three weekly renters left um, that have just been great payers. Now they, they pay more, um, basically paying on the weekly, but the quote unquote, um, downside of that, right. weighed a lot more than trying to get out a couple extra dollars. Okay. That makes perfect sense. So you guys are okay with, with all of that. I've definitely don't know that I've ever heard of weekly renters. How do you even set something like that up? It was, uh, he had two different books running, so that's how he was trying to do it. So it was a, it was enough of a process, but most of the time he was finding th these were people that couldn't get qualified anywhere. So we were just letting anybody in, right? So we're setting up clear application processes. And most of the time, the weekly was staying longer, right? Cause they get in there and they'd stay past a week. Makes perfect sense. Okay. Interesting. Definitely not an approach I would take, but you know, nope. <laughs> makes sense. So Obviously, a big part of this is obviously the investors and setting that expectation for investors, especially with some of these lifts and these these long term projects. So I know a big thing for you is, you know, finding or raising capital without having to actually ask for it. So talk to me about, you know, what you guys are doing in terms of, you know, finding your investors and, and setting that expectation and keeping those investors, you know, for, for the long term. Sure. So it's honestly just letting your community know what you're doing, right? Like right now you're speaking on this podcast, your network, hearing you speak about what you do. So they start to get familiar with the process. When we were coming over from the construction world, the bar world, I, you know, we lived in New York City, we had a bunch of friends that just had no exposure to this, but also didn't understand it, right? And so we waited for the opportunity of the deal to come up and then tried to go to them. It's a huge learning curve, right? And especially if it's, okay, who's Jason? You know, why, what has he done in his past? What's he now doing in real estate? What is this multifamily thing? Why are you investing a thousand miles away? Um, you know, how are you going to make that work? And, oh, you want $50,000, right? That, that's a tall order for someone on a fact of just saying, okay, first time, here's the deal. But if you can go there, speak to them about what you're doing, why you're doing it, how you've shown up before in, in other things, whether it's been multifamily that you've been in or, or it's a new space why you love multifamily, why you're investing in a certain market, and how it works, how the structure works, and give them something to digest. And basically get to the point, well, what would you like to, would this be interesting for you to invest in the future? Well, you can start having that warm conversation when that opportunity presents itself, right? Because you go back to them. It also gives you clarity too, that you're not cold not trying to say, well, I hope I can raise a million, two million, three million dollars, because you've now subjectively raised, say it's 25,000 or 50,000 from 50 people, right? That have said, oh, I'd be interested, right? When that opportunity comes up, well, in your mind, you now can feel better that potentially you could raise about two, two and a half million dollars when you find that kind of opportunity. So it also shows what side deal I can go after at the gate. That makes perfect sense. And that's so true, right? Obviously we're biased in that we, want everyone to see multifamily and real estate investing the way that we see it, but that's just not the case, right? So really it's so important to educate investors yeah. or potential investors on wh why you're doing this and why you think it would be a great fit for them. And listen, if it's not a great fit for them, that's fine, right? We're not here trying to sell you on an investment. We just want to know if you think it would be a good fit. So Obviously, you guys have started to build a really awesome uh, investor base, and I'm sure referrals and that are starting to roll in. So what is happening on the back end that you guys, you know, are using drip campaigns? Like, 
what is what is the the conversation when you don't have a deal look like in terms of you know keeping your investors engaged? Um, it's constantly giving them insight about what we're doing, what we're looking at, what we see out there in the market, deals we are currently active on, what we're doing in those deals, how we're improving them, how we're keeping to the plan, and then getting out in podcasts like this one right here and just talking to you and talking to your community so we can continue to help other people understand what we do and also help get them to the stage they want to be at. Awesome. That's so important, right? You got to keep them engaged. Now, as you guys are doing that and, and they're rolling in, are you, you know, handling like an investor relations, like getting on the phone with them and keeping that up as well? We are. Yeah, we, we always want to get on a conversation with a new investor here. When they come into our ecosystem, we do look to schedule a call with them. We want to understand because I can get a form that says, oh, they're accredited. They've invested syndication before, but I want to make sure that I'm, I have opportunities that are going to be good for them, right? Because if it's not the same thing like you said here, I don't want to just slam them with opportunities that aren't going to fit, right? So if they want long-term holds and I'm looking at a one to three-year opportunity, what's well, not going to be right for them. If I'm looking at something that's cash flow heavy, you know, but the, the limits, I guess, limits the, the upside potential on the back end here. And they're really driven just on equity here. They don't care about the cash flow here. So I, or the other point, or if I have a development opportunity and they want cash flow, it's not going to be the right opportunity for them. So understanding what's important to them, what's a driver for them, uh, how quickly they want to invest, when they're looking to park their money, uh, if there's markets they want to invest in or not, that helps us better understand the investor themselves so we can help make good decisions with them about whether or not our opportunities would be right for them. Do, your, do the investors in the conversation you're having ever dictate a potential shift in like your thesis or what you're going after or anything like no. that? No. No, I get back to like the, I remember uh, the brewery business. It was like, we first started out, we we're like a small little New York City brewery. We're just doing kegs, right? And every time you went to see like a bar or restaurant, well, if you just had six doors or you just had, you know, or you just had 22s or you just had cans, then we take you. It was like, it, if you're constantly chasing what's out there, you're never really meeting anything. You're right. So you, you have no clear vision. So here's what we do, right? That we know it's a model that's worked for us. We know there's an investor pool out there. And this is what's worked for us and we'll continue to build upon, but we're not going to jump all over just to meet it um, for, for investors because it, it doesn't serve them well either because we really, then we have, really have no backing to what we actually stand for. Absolutely. I love that. That's such, that's so true, right? You really got to stick to your game plan and then you're building an investor pool that knows you so that they trust you and it's not, the, you know, and you're not chasing them, which is, it's so, so important when you're building that investor base and, and it's a quality investor, right? You know that yeah. they're going to be with you in the long term. And if you do decide, hey, you know what? We found this uh, development deal. Then they know, like, and trust you and will follow you on that path as well. Thousand percent. Awesome. I love that so much. So now with obviously the economic landscape looking how it is, what is, if, has anything shifted in your guys' outlook or what are kind of, you know, your goals moving forward for 2022 and so on? We've been consistent on looking at one deal a quarter. I mean, that's been a good part. We've been passively aggressive in that light. We don't need to buy a deal, right? But we are looking at opportunities that have a good risk profile in better areas, right? So we were buying C-class assets um, back starting in 2017. We think um, that tenant base can be more exposed, right? As inflation continues to ramp up, things cost more. It's harder. Rent keeps going up. You know, their paycheck, it's basically their wage inflation is not tracking with, with price inflation. So we want to be careful on that side, put on debt, that we feel good with that can sustain here, especially as the tide may change a couple of years out of where we're going. So that's really the, the two main parts we're focusing on. Okay. Yeah. That's so important. And especially in this landscape, obviously interest rates already going up, going to continue to go up. So, yeah. so important to have that debt over leverage. I was just having another conversation. That's a very scary aspect right now. So many people just want to get the deal done. You've got these bridge loans and some of this debt, it just, <laughs> does not, doesn't look good, unfortunately. Yeah, there's a, that's why we see a lot of things moving bridge right now, just because the price values have gone up that you just put the income, current income on there. It's just hard to get into, you know, a true loan to value loan, right? Because you just, you're, you'd be walking in at like 60, 55% loan to value on some of these properties. Absolutely. And if I understand correctly, these markets you're in are not huge, right? It's not, rent didn't go up 20% like Austin, Texas last year. It's very steady growth. Is that? Uh, I, I'd say, of course, 
Atlanta's had the most drive, Nashville not far behind, and then Louisville behind, right? But okay. Louisville still had growth ahead of Proforma, right? Everything's ahead of Proforma right now, which has been interesting, but we've seen the most traction happening as we, of course, push down further into the Southeast. Okay, so you are getting into some of those corridors that are yeah. seeing that that increased growth and those kind of exponential. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we took on uh, property indicated Georgia like four months ago and um, you know, I guess a week before we were closing, the uh, the owner or the seller had a rent uh, new lease that came up that was fifty dollars higher than our pro forma in the year one, and it was just like, <laughs> that's a great thing to have. But the same front too, it's just like, man, like you know, both sides of it. One, um, okay, that changes the dynamic of our pro forma, but two, like something, this is getting crazy. Absolutely, absolutely, it's so true, and. Something to obviously keep an eye on, which of course you guys are, you're obviously very involved in the community as well. And, you know, going back to effective asset management, that's not just managing your asset, that's also keeping a pulse on the market yep. and understanding the market. And as things change, being able to, you know, shift your, even your business plan, you know, right away. Yeah, it's that point here where you should, sometimes it's like, we think it's like set it and forget it but you have to constantly be running your analysis of how your property is tracking. We do weekly calls with property manager just for that case, right? You know, it, just like anything, if a large ship gets off track, it's not like you can just uh, basically steer yourself back on in 20 seconds, right? So if you got, you know, a, a leak in the property for four months, it's not like you stop the leak and everything goes back to normal, right? And so keeping your eye on what's actually happening with the operations, that's how you can keep systematically in line with where your business plan is going. Absolutely. And then it sounds like, are you guys also a proponent um, in some of these? Do you rebrand as well? Uh, depends. So the one I talked about with the short, uh, with the short term weekly rentals, we rebranded re that, right? It just had such a bad image. Um, but we brought another one in town that just great property. So we just kept the name. So it really just depends on, on how the asset was perceived. Like we just bought two indicator, one stayed, one was rebranded. Okay. Makes perfect sense. So you guys are just agile, basically whatever whatever is necessary, you feel is necessary for the asset. Yeah, I mean, if the marketing is, is fine with the property, it just it just pour on, on the business plan or they have a business plan that's worked for them and, and it's not so much tenant base or others, you can build upon that. But if it's just such a bad property, so many things wrong with it in the part, you're taking over to improve it, right? The marketing, the image has been bad for over the years. You want to set a new story, a new narrative on what's happening. I love that. It's so important. Awesome. All right. Well, we are nearing the end. It's crazy how fast these go, but I do have five questions. The final five awesome. questions I ask everyone. So the first question is the best advice you've gotten from a mentor. Uh, this too shall pass, right? We get so caught up in short-term things, but if you look in the long-term horizon, most things that happen that were poor, um, you can't remember, right? So if you look in the long-term vision, you can help you make better decisions. I love that. That's so true. What is it about your career that makes you feel like you're fulfilling your why? Uh, I can go after this, hang out with my kids. Easy enough, gets back to it, right? That's so awesome. I love that. Really, the freedom is really what we're all after. I love it. What's your favorite non-real estate or investment-related book? Uh, it's always, honestly, the last one or current one I'm reading. Uh, so we got um, Gary V. 12 and a half. I guess that's what it's called. I forget what it is, but that's what I'm reading right now. It's got some really good stuff. Nice. I love it. Gary V. Always. He's, uh, he's awesome. Awesome yeah, guy. Sure. Powerful energy for sure. Uh, if you could have any superpower, what would it be? Oh, man. This is a great question for my wife. She loves Marvel in this part. Um, I mean, you have to say flying, right? I think that would, I guess you have to say flying. I, I mean, I, I, that would be mine for sure. Yeah. What, uh, what superhero, what's your favorite superhero? That's another one for my wife, man. I'm, so you know she's, hers. Do you know what hers she's, is? Uh, she's got a lot. She's all over, the, all over the place. Here. I love that. Let's say, let's say Batman, just because Batman has no naturally inclined superpowers, right? And so that, that puts him in the best way. I love that. Awesome. And last one, what's the best way for people to get a hold of you and uh, learn more about you guys? Yeah, you can go over to your Rusi Holdings, Y-A-R-U-S-I Holdings.com. You can find everything about our company, Multifamily Live, our podcast, our mastermind, Seven Figure Multifamily, or Jason Yerusi across uh, you know, Instagram or Facebook. Awesome. We will link all of that in the show notes. Jason, this has been awesome. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching today's episode. I hope you really enjoyed it. Listen, I know it's cliche and you hear it all the time, but 
please don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel so you know when the next video is coming out. Even though this is technically a daily podcast, you know it's coming out the next day. Uh, we have a ton of content coming your way. So please like and subscribe. It helps a ton. Leave comments. We'd love to know what you guys think. And uh, we will see you on the next one. Thanks so much.